stepping up to the plate Go, go, can't be late, story to tell, we bout to excel Tell them pick up the pace, we are just here to create We stepping up to the plate, go, go, can't be late Story to tell, we bout to excel, tell them pick up the pace Emir Tialata is from the Samoan village of Lano Manu in Upulu. He was born in Lower Hutt and attended Parkway College and Wellington College. He played 65 games for Wellington, 101 games for the Hurricanes, and was capped 43 times for the All Blacks as a prop forward. He then went over to France to play for Bayonne, Toulouse, and Narbonne. He has since returned home where he runs a pharmacy with his wife Sally. He also has his own wine business. No, my hara mai ki te whakawhiti kōrero ki Wanganui a māua i te rā nei talofa lava ni mea tia lata. What's up, boys? Kia ora. Kia ora. How's it going, bro? How's the week been? I hear you've been on holiday up in uh, Taupo. How did that go for you? Yeah, pretty good. Uh, much needed rest. Um, we've been going hard since uh, October last year, so and right, obviously right through the, the lockdown for COVID, and so. Um, yeah, we thought we'd take a, a week of a break and uh, head away to Taupo with the kids. Nice one, nice. So, uh, Nimea, uh, you were born in Lower Hutt, but you moved to Americans, American Samoa for a few years with your family as a toddler before returning to New Zealand. Can you tell us a bit yeah. about your just your late parents, Sipotasi and the Reverend Palema, the way they brought you up and the memories you and your three sisters had growing up as kids? Oh, that's a good question. I've, I've never had this question before. Um, uh, my sort of fondest memories of my parents growing up uh, and the way that, that they've taught me and my sisters were um, was always to, to be humble and and God first and family, um, which is what I've always been about and even throughout my rugby career and, and to this day now I have kids um so to try to try to pass that on to them. Um but uh yeah not not too much memories. Uh, obviously my my father passed away when uh when I was about nine I think. And then my mother passed away when I was about thirteen so yeah. Um but we were lucky enough that my um my mother's uh, sister took us in uh, with her five kids, who, uh, who I call my brothers and sisters. Uh, so we we were lucky. We had a massive, uh, obviously a massive family. Um, heaps of us kids in in a three bedroom house. Um, and my auntie became my mother, and well, she became my hero growing up. Um, and to this to this day, she's still she's still around. Um, she also lives with my sister over in Wainui, and I go and see her quite regularly. And I take my kids over to to uh, to see her and say hello, and we take her out uh, now and then, and and also see her uh, at church as well. So yeah. So you play. You mentioned Wainui Mata there. Uh, you played rugby league for the Wainui Mata League Club as a junior. How much of an influence did the Wainui Mata League Club have on you and on your career? Uh, yeah, well, that was where I started. Um, I was quite fortunate that I um, that I was in a part of, uh, I think it was Wainui under 10s or under 11s, where I, I met uh, the likes of Piri Wipu, who's one of my best mates. Uh, David Faumi, uh, who played with the Cowboys and also went on to be a Kiwi, um, and also Paul Fatuita. So, yeah, look, um, that played a big part in, uh, in, in my career. Obviously, uh, playing with those guys and seeing the way, um, see, see them uh, develop uh, within, within the what do you call it, sports that they were doing and uh, wanting to be a part of that and and then obviously it's gone full circles and then uh, just meeting up with them, uh, you know, at NYU and just talking about the good old days. You attended Parkway yeah. College in uh, Wainui Mata, Nimea, and Wellington College in the city. What type of student were you and what were some of the academic and sporting moments that <laughs> really stood out for you in both of these schools? <laughs> 
Yeah, I went to Parkwood College and I actually wasn't, um, I wouldn't say I was a good student. I was, I was a bit naughty. Um, I was there for three years. And then it's, it's probably a blessing in disguise because um, obviously if I had stayed there and, um, and finished off my, my senior years there, I wouldn't have been the person who I am today and had made it this far. Obviously, um, there, was, there was a group of us and it was, it was, it was myself, uh, David Faumi, who, who was good mates of mine, and, and Pity as well at the time. We all... We're all at Pākwe College at the same time, and um, our deputy principal said to us, sat, sat us down and said, "Look, um, um, if we uh, if we basically hang around, you know, stay in Wainui, we, we won't get any further than than <laughs> than Oshie Wainui." So he did us a good favour and said to us, "Look, I think it's best uh, if you guys um, uh, look elsewhere for." schooling opportunities and so that's how, how it all started and just by chance um, I tried to, I tried tried my luck over here in, in the hut with St Bernard's and uh, the, the headmaster there turned me down he said that uh, there was too many uh, my new boys that, that were there at the school at the time oh. so I said oh yeah sweet as but then my uncle uh, um, took me out to Wellington College because he had uh, a few good friends um, who had sons that, that were at the school, and he said that uh, look, uh, I think I can get you in there, and, or at least a, a meeting with the headmaster, Roger Moses. So went there and straight away he accepted me. I hated it first day. I hated it because uh, uh, I obviously had to wear a uniform, uh, and it was an all boys school. So <laughs> yeah, that's quite weird for me. And then. Um, and yeah, I think the biggest thing that I, that I sort of learned when I got to Wellington College was the um, how passionate the boys were about um, about the school, um, how proud they were, um, and wearing the school uniform, and how they conducted themselves around in the public eye, and and also in the classrooms and that. So it was a big difference and big shift from. Uh, Parkway College in Wainui, so um, that was a massive uh, change for me and a massive wake-up call and, and like I said, a, a, probably a, a blessing in disguise. Uh, the scrum doctor, Mike Cron, is one of your mentors and I believe you lived with him for a brief period of time early in your career. How did this all come about and how much of an influence was Mike Cron on you? Um... I believe it was a, uh, a a training session that he that we we were a part of. I can't I can't remember exactly. Um, I think it was either the Hurricanes or an All Black sort of session where I was part of the Wellington team and I went in to um, just to help out. And uh, he saw me pack down against the likes of um, uh, Greg Somerville. Um, uh, who else was there? Case News, Carl Hoff. Um, these are the guys that um, that took me through a um, a training session a year before when I was at school. So I actually kind of spotted me up there and um, uh, invited me down to his, uh, his first ever sort of like front row uh, coaching clinic. And we spent, uh, so I flew down from Wellington and I, I met up with... Um, a guy from Auckland who's uh, his name is John Afour. Uh, there was also uh, White Crockett was there. Um, who else was there? A few of the boys, and then uh, yeah, we spent um, I think a few a couple of weeks down in Christchurch or Crono, and uh, and it was just all about scrummaging. Um, and obviously at the time I was playing Lucid, so. I didn't know much about the tight head side, but he um, he insisted that I learnt uh, how to pack down on the tight head side. And then obviously a couple of years after that, I was playing both sides um, and did it quite well. So, yeah, that's how I first uh, got to come across Connor and, yeah. 
So a year after making your debut for Wellington in the NPC, you made your debut for the Hurricanes where you played over 101 games. The closest you got to a championship was that infamous fog final down in Christchurch against the Crusaders in 2006. And I was at that game, bro. And I was up on the high green stand. And um, I tell you what, I think I missed 79 minutes of that game as well. Um, uh, yeah. Can you talk us through how the team prepared for that game? And of course, what was it like playing in that weird game? Yeah, it was strange, man. Leading up to it, we knew we uh, we knew we had them because we played them uh, during the obviously uh, round robin, and um, I can't remember how, what the score was, but yeah, we lost to them. But we knew uh, going into into finals that uh, we had them because we were on fire uh, leading up to that, and flipping now everything was going well. Um, their training that week was, I, I, all I remember, it just went really quick and the boys was just on edge and ready, like, ready to go. And just before, because half, I mean, uh, during the warm-up wasn't too bad as well. It was as soon as the, uh, we ran out to do the, uh, to the anthem and that, they probably couldn't see anything. It was weird, but they should have, um, to this day, I, I think that they should have called the game off or something like that, postponed it for, maybe uh, half an hour to wait until that fog passed. But obviously we played it and uh, yeah, it is what it is. I still remember my mate probably, uh, getting knocked out. Uh, I think that was the only thing I saw. So looking back, yeah. at, looking back at your Hurricanes career, Nimir, uh, which moment stood out for you the most? Obviously you played with a whole bunch of superstars. But yeah, which moment stood out for you? Oh, it's hard to um, yeah, it's hard to pick. Um, I played with so many good players, uh, obviously legends of the game. Um, I went to I, I bumped into you boys. Uh, was it last week? A week before? Oh yeah. And, and that was my I think my second game that I've gone back to watch uh, Hurricanes, and I was just watching them, and I was like flipping. Uh, I can imagine when. I I was like thinking, uh, like, um, wait, sorry, my kids have just arrived. That's all good, sorry. bro. I was just thinking of, uh, I was just thinking of how lucky I was uh, back when I started. Um, I had um, yeah, superstars all around me, and just watching those boys the other night, um, yeah, it just wasn't the same, eh? <laughs> hey, so who, who were some of your closest mate, uh, mates at the Hurricanes in there? And do you still meet up and catch up with them these days? Uh, well, well, obviously my best mate is, I grew up with him, obviously Pity. He lives down the road from me, so I see him like <laughs> uh, every uh, every morning because we catch up to obviously train and that in the mornings. And, uh, who else is there? Uh, Ma as well. Um, another one I met earlier on in um, our school days and that. Um, and then obviously the the older the older boys the older brothers like uh, Tana and that obviously from being from Waimu, um and Jerry and all that so yeah pretty close. I suppose with um, Pity on your team, you'll never be short of Kai Moana, eh, bro? <laughs> oh mate, that's it. Uh, yeah, whenever we wanted a, a day off or a week off, we'd tell Pity to go. <laughs> Go for a dive, give it to your, to, the, to the coaches and that get, get us a week off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so in, um, in 2005, you made your All Blacks debut against Wales at the Millennium Stadium uh, alongside your good friend Chris Masoy. Uh, the All Blacks won that day 41 to 3 as part of a Grand Slam tour. What do you remember most about your first test in the black jersey, leading it like the days leading up, the game itself, and, and afterwards? Oh, bro, wicked, man. I, um, yeah, the week went really quick. All I remember was, uh, what I remember was being told that I was going to start uh, my first test. And, um, and the build up to it was awesome. Um, had a lot of media to do. Um, and all I remember uh, was, was obviously, <laughs> yeah, funny, funny story was we we're doing the, the warm up in that. And I was looking around the stadium, and I was like, "Flip!" Actually, they 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 hold a I think it was eighty eighty plus thousand people. 
I'm, I'm standing there at a lineup warm up, and I'm saying to um, I said to uh, Ali Williams at the time, I said, "Fuck, bro, there's there's no one here." But you know, normally during the the warm up, like it's his and everyone's there, like you know. And so he just gave me a wink and he said, "Oh, just just wait, brother. Just you'll wait, wait and see." So we go back into the change rooms, and I'm putting my boot boot on, and um, and it's just yeah. Couldn't hear the noise or anything. I thought it was a sold out crowd. So I think there's a photo. Um, one of the photographers, oh, I've got it on my laptop actually. Um, we come out of the tunnel, and actually, when you come out of the tunnel, there's a, there's a couple of steps, and all you can see is just a pitch, and it's just a tunnel down. So uh, we come out of the tunnel, just, I still couldn't hear anything until you come out of the tunnel, and the noise just hits you, bro. And uh, there's this photo where <laughs> I nearly tripped. I was hit the last step and I uh, nearly uh, did the full cartwheel in there. But um, yeah, I've got a photo of that and uh, yeah, so that was funny, man. I look at it now and I'm, I still remember that moment. So that, that when the, actually hit the field and the crowd hits you, the noise hits you, I'm like, look, the now this is, this is everything I dreamt of, uh, of being an all black. And, and also playing my first test as well. Uh, so I'm very special. Uh, obviously did the anthem, can't remember doing the haka, and obviously can't remember playing the game, but I played the full game and, and we smoked them. <laughs> Beautiful result. <laughs> yeah. hey, um, one of your biggest strengths, Nimi, is um, you having the ability to prop on both sides of the scrum. Um, did this come naturally to you and how much preparation was involved to ensure that you remain strong in both of these positions, loose head and um, tight head? Uh, yeah, it wasn't naturally. Um, it, wasn't, it didn't come overnight. It took, uh, took years of um, trying to, uh, obviously trying to master, uh, obviously the, the tight head side to the hardest because you've got the you've got the loose head and the hooker's head there. Well, on the loose head side, all you're worrying about is obviously the tight head. So back in the well, back when I was playing, it was the uh, the old the old crouch, and then just fucking dive in. Mm. And I used to come down to the quickest. Uh, obviously, the quickest off the mark was would be and the lowest to get you know the first thing to, to you know as low as you can so that's how it was back when i i was playing and um that was just a, a skill that i had to um it was right repetition like it's one of those things you had to stay on top of like a like a golf like you know your golfers and that we um yeah just more reps man that's that's what it came down to in 2007, the IRB introduced the experimental laws which sped up the game and meant that front rowers would need to be more mobile around the park. How much of an effect did these laws have on your own personal game? Um, yeah, they said that every year I played and there was nothing wrong with it. I just adapted and obviously, um, it just, yeah, just changed the way I played. Uh, every year, we keep changing these laws. No. Nothing at all. Um, uh, I think I was criticised in my early years for being probably one of the pioneers of uh, a floating um, prop forward who was like, always in the outside the obviously standing at first five or first receiver. Um, but I sort of took it upon myself that I would I'd be the best of the world at, at doing it and trying to bust the the, the first tackler. So it's, and it's what I. I usually did, um, but then obviously the obviously the the game changed with the uh, with the way the uh, you know they, they've taken they took the contact out of the scrums, so it meant that it was more um, yeah you, you hardly saw any pushing or anything like that because by the time you try and push it the, the opposition will just collapse it and, and you get the fifty fifty call from the referees. So apart from that. Um, no, I didn't think um, you know, it affected me much. Hey, you were part of that um, 2007 side that lost to France um, and was spoken to Sir Steve Hansen and Wayne Smith about this match. As a player, what were your memories of that match and how much did you learn from that particular game in 2007? 
Mm. What the hell? Uh, <laughs> um, everything that went wrong for us in that day, that, that's all I remember. Um, yeah, I think uh, preparing for preparing for the worst because I think leading up to it, we were on fire for a few years. Um, and obviously a lot of things didn't go our way and, and the boys just didn't know what to do. And that was probably the first time ever we didn't have a, an answer for for that. Where I know nowadays, I, I know that um, from that they they took a lot of learnings and lessons. And now they've got plan A right down to Z. <laughs> so I think, yeah, that's probably the biggest thing that come out of that. Um, Apart from that, it is what it is, and you know, you win some, you lose some, and it just had to be that time. <laughs> so you played your final test against Wales in 2010. Looking back at your All Blacks career, what were you most proud of? Um, to be honest, I think um, it would have to be uh, just doing what I love with with, with my mates. You know, everyone that I um, that I was a part of um, in, in that black jersey, um, they were all good good guys, and they're all, all, all to this day are all my good mates, and um, they're guys that I can actually pick up the phone and uh, just carry on from where we left off. You know, so I think that's yeah, that's that's what I um, yeah, take out of it. You've also impressed off the field by designing and selling t-shirts, raising thousands of dollars for the victims of the 2009 Samoan earthquake and the tsunami and for your home village of Laro Manu, um, which was badly affected. You also helped raise $30,000 for the Christchurch earthquake victims by organizing a charity basketball game. How important is it for you, Nemea, to give back to the community? Huge. Uh, obviously, um, but we're fortunate. You know, the players nowadays are fortunate um, that we paid well. Uh, we looked after pretty well too, so I think uh, if there's anything we could do with um, with our profile to help out, then um, yeah, then why not? Um, um, yeah, I was just I was just one of those guys that whatever whatever was going on, I sort of put my hand up first to to sort of lead the way and that sort of thing. Um, and it's it's quite rewarding to see guys like, uh, like Ari Savia who's doing that nowadays, you know, and it's pretty cool to see. Um, but yeah, that's just what we that's what we uh, that's what we did. Um, not, not only myself, but I know I got Pity and uh, even Corey Jane were, were a part of that as well. Um, but yeah, just giving back, man, you have to. Just touching on those t-shirts you designed. So you're you're quite a creative person. I don't think many people know this, but do you want to talk a little bit more about? Um, you've got a degree, don't you, in uh, design? Is that correct? Or yeah, design yeah. visual arts. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So that's my first love and first my actual first uh, sort of passion was was designing and drawing and painting, just whatever I can get my hands to, and just creating. Um, I still do a, a bit of that. Um, obviously, with the wine business, I um, I do a lot of that with our packaging and all all of that stuff and designing the bottles and yeah, so it's quite good, um, especially when you're full on playing, training, travelling. Um, you know, you need an outlet. You need something like that where you can just zone out and um, and just do you, and it helps you. Uh, Oh, she's freshen, freshen you up for the week. Um, oh, that's what it did for me. And um, and also she creates a bit of balance as well. So it can't be all just uh, about rugby. That's right, exactly. So in 2011, you uh, make the big move over to France and you went on to play rugby for Bayonne, Toulouse and Narbonne. What was it like living and playing in France? Oh, awesome, man. Loved my time there. Uh, we could have easily stayed there and lived there forever and ever, but uh, we had these two girls over there and we thought we'd bring them back home to, to obviously be closer to family and 
and obviously home. So now we loved our time over there. Um, um, met a lot of good people, um, and obviously got to continue my uh, my career there with um, with a lot of my good mates from here too that we know them and did the same. So that was awesome, man. In 2015, your good friend Jerry Collins and his partner Alana Medill died in a tragic car accident and their baby daughter Ayla survived. You and Chris Masoi were there to support Ayla and the family at this time. How does this tragic moment affect you personally and how much of an impact did Jerry and his family have on you? Um, yeah, tough one. I sort of, I, like, to this day, it still hasn't really sunk in that he's, that he's gone. I was, I was obviously one of the first. Um, I had to go and identify his body, um, and even so, I, I sat there for like, I think mean, the the week that I had um, there to dress him and and spend with him. I, you know, I just sat there and just like chatted away, like as if he was still alive. And obviously the bent and the and the jokes that you know that was flying. Um, through uh through vodkas that we were having. <laughs> no, but um yeah, tough times. But um I'm just happy and glad that um that actually Ayla is I mean survived and and she's doing really well. Um but uh yeah to this day I I miss him. But uh yeah I, I still can't I can't get it through my head that he's actually gone, gone, which is why I still haven't been up to a cemetery to see him. Mm. Mm. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. Uh, so you now you're you're back in New Zealand. Uh, you now run a pharmacy with your wife Sally in Brooklyn here in Wellington, and you run your own wine business. Um, so you're still keeping very busy. So how's that all going for you? And and what anything else on the horizon for you and your family? Um, no, just too busy with that. Eh? The pharmacy's full on, and then obviously with the wine business too, um, that's slowly taking off. Uh, we've got a lot of products that are coming, new products coming in, and um, hopefully at the end of the year. Um, and obviously having two young girls, um, I sort of promised them that I'll put, um, you know, a lot more time into them uh, when we come back home and let the missus at the pharmacy, but uh, that's gone out the window, and I'm sort of down there every day. Um, I was lucky enough that I got to finish work early and come home <laughs> early. Normally, I'm still there um, late on a Monday. Um, and we're also lucky that we've got uh, beautiful grandparents that are <laughs> sort of full on uh, hands on with the kids as well, so they, have, they help out a lot, uh, which makes it easy for us. Um, but yeah, we're, we're still young in this this business sort of scene, and we just, we're just on the grind and trying to trying to do what's uh, what we what we need to do now to ensure that it's uh, all good for the kids later on. Yeah, for sure. Car pie to that. What's the name of your wine business? Do you want to do a little plug just for our listeners and our viewers? Oh yeah, Du Chavot. So um, Du Chavot is um, is. We created a company here in New Zealand, and it's uh, but all our our wine and product in there, it's all produced in South of France and Melbourne. Um, with my good friend and business partner uh, Camille Lapin, and he's my wine guy. So yeah, hey, we've got a bit of a challenge <laughs> for you, Nemir. We do this at the end of every podcast before we wrap it up, so it's called Nine and Ten. So we're going to give you um, one topic. And to that one topic, you've got to give us nine answers. So if we said to you, name nine currencies in the world, you'd say Canadian dollar, American dollar, Thai bar, Vietnamese dong, things like that. So you got the uh, stopwatch there, bro? Alrighty. You should get this one because um, it, it was it was in your area while you uh, play rugby over in France. So we're expecting that. Uh, but you've got to be quick on your feet on this one, though, bro. Alrighty. Oh, shit. Here you go. Okay. <laughs> Ten Nimea, seconds. Ten seconds. All right, here we go. Nimea Tealata from Wainui Amata. <laughs> Name for me in ten seconds nine countries in Europe. 
Go. <laughs> oh, shucks. Uh, Italy. Um, fucking uh, Spain. Is that one? It's it's harder than what you think, bro. And like we always say, once you get off here, you'll remember all the countries in Europe, eh? So, uh, yeah, man. Not many have got it. I'm used to that. We've done about twenty episodes, and we think we've only had two, maybe two or three winners. So, uh, right, I'm used to that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Hey, thank you so much for your time tonight. And um, you take care, and I hope the business goes well. And uh, all the very best for the future. No, no worries, guys. And uh, appreciate for uh, you know, having me on, and all the best with you guys as well. <laughs>